Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to subscribe. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that oftentimes starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. Our goal is to get our clients to live a life nearly symptom free. Today I had the honor and pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Joseph Musto. He is the founder of Microbiology DX. If you've ever done Marcon's testing or the nasal swab test for Marcon's, you have probably sent it to the Microbiology DX lab. I wanted Dr. Musto on just to explain the importance of Marcon's, why it's important to test, and the importance of the eradication of Marcon's. If you have a biotoxin illness or mold illness or SIRS, if you don't treat Marcon's, it will perpetuate the illness. And he goes into a lot of that detail. I have personally met Dr. Musto in person, I think one or two times, but he is such a sweet man and you will see it in the interview. Dr. Musto is a president and the director of laboratory medicine. He's a medical director and the founder of Microbiology DX. He was the founder and president of diagnostic laboratory medicine for more than 20 years and then founded Microbiology DX. Dr. Musto has been involved in laboratory medicine and methods development for clinical testing for over 40 years. And he has more than 20 publications and seven issued patents. Dr. Musto is a board certified clinical laboratory director and has spent 10 years pre and post doctoral training in a clinical laboratory science to help clinicians get people to root cause healing. As I just read his bio, I realized that Dr. Musto also created clinical assays for TIBC scores and C-reactive proteins. I'll definitely have him on to talk about that. That's so fascinating. And just in case, TIBC is total iron binding capacity. It's one of the markers that we test for iron sufficiency. Okay, guys, let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Musto. I am super excited to have you join. There's so much information about Marcon's that I really just want people to understand better. For the people that are listening and watching that may not know you, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Dr. Joe Musto. I'm the uh, president and the director of Microbiology DX. We're the lab that does the Marcon's testing and a couple of other tests related to uh, mold illness. And uh, I've been in the field of laboratory medicine for about 52 years, have had uh, decades of experience in full service clinical laboratories, like those in a hospital, for example. And uh, now I have gone into a specialty, which is strictly microbiology, and it's worked out very well. It all started in uh, 2011, when I had a conversation with Dr. Shoemaker, and he was looking for a lab to do the Marcon's testing. And that was when I had a lab called Diagnostic Laboratory Medicine. You may still see that on the uh, website. And in 2015, I established Microbiology DX. And then what is Marcon's? Um, I know there are some people that understand SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, mold illness. What does Marcon's have to do with all of this? Okay. Well, Marcon's stands for Multiple Antibiotic Resistant Coag Negative Staph. Dr. Shoemaker in 2003 along with two other colleagues, uh, presented a study at the uh, American Society of Microbiology at that time. And that study established the significance, I believe, of what Marcon's was and how it was involved in his protocol with regard to biotoxin illness. He had uh, 399 patients and uh, who had symptoms of biotoxin illness and about 112 patients that had uh, no symptoms at all. The ones who had symptoms were diagnosed with biotoxin illness and they had low MSH. And he treated those patients with cholestyramine. He found that patients who had nasal coag negative staph who had one resistant antibiotic or patients in that study that had no coag negative staph, they had the same number of symptoms, about 10 out of 16, 10 out of 18 symptoms. The patients who had two resistant antibiotics had an increase in the number of symptoms, up to 14 symptoms. Then there was a third category, and not a lot of people talk about this, patients who had methicillin-resistant antibiotics and penicillin resistant, had 16 symptoms. 
And when they were treated with cholestyramine, the ones who had one, one resistant or no coag negative staph went from 10 symptoms to like one, one symptom. Right. The ones with Marcon's went from something like 12 symptoms to about four symptoms. And the one with methicillin resistance went from 16 to nine. He found that the methicillin resistant were harder to treat and would relapse. So that got the Marcon's established as significance related to those patients with low MSH, the Marcon's causes the MSH to go even lower and improvement occurs with the biotoxins in terms of the MSH level when they're el eliminated with the appropriate binders. And when the Marcon's are eliminated with the appropriate nasal sprays, then the MSH goes from maybe minus, uh, less than eight up to maybe 20 or 22. And from what I'm told by clinicians, the patients start to feel better significantly. I've been told by clinicians that uh, patients who do not eradicate the Marcon's never completely recover wow. because the Marcon's are excreting uh, toxins that cause breakdown of the MSH. And Marcon's, according to Dr. Shoemaker, you'll hear me say that a lot, according to Dr. Shoemaker, okay? Marcon's uh, are a marker of low MSH. There are doctors who treat patients from old illness who don't believe in Marcon's. And I think the reason is they're not aware of how this relationship was established. Is Marcon's mostly in the nasal cavity? I think it's also sometimes in the oral area, but um, just to have the people that are listening and watching understand. So MSH is one of the master hormones that gets affected by a biotoxin illness or mold or water damage building illness. Yes. It reduces that master hormone, which then affects a lot of this multi-symptom, multi-system. So the chronic fatigue, exactly. sleep issues, electrolyte imbalance issues, hormone issues. And so part of what you're saying is that when you have Marcon's, it further exacerbates the MSH to stay low. Yeah. So exactly. then if you can talk about where Marcon's lives, maybe the nose, the, the sure. oral area, and then are there symptoms of like, how do I know Marcon's is what I'm struggling with? And then some people with chronic sinusitis, when we test for Marcon's, they're positive. Is there a relationship with that? Well, from, from what I understand, Marcon's generally don't have any symptoms. Okay. They don't cause sinusitis and rhinitis. That's from a, you know clinical input from physicians and other clinicians treating patients. When you consider having the Marcon's in the nasal cavity and a patient now gets the flu, virus like that is going to cause compromise of the immune system. And whenever the immune system is compromised, even though these organisms that colonize us, they can turn into infectious organisms. So generally, Marcon's is considered a colonizer rather than an infection. But it does have symptoms related to brain fog and cognitive issues. Uh, people have complained about those kinds of issues. So it, it's an important test in the whole series. And I, I'm not saying that because we happen to do the test, right. but uh, all of the reading I've done and going to the meetings as you have as well, talking to clinicians who are seeing the patients face to face, uh, there's a lot of significance to this. I, I wanna talk a, a little bit about what occurred oh, about three years or so ago. I, I was getting reports from doctors who said, my patient is colonized with Marcon's and we can't eradicate it. And I would look at, say, one patient over the period of a year who has had three cultures and their Marcon's are continuously positive. Mm -hmm. Continuous is the key word here. They will, really weren't continuous. Here's the point. Patient has low MSH. MSH protects the nasal passage, passage from recontracting Marcon's. So with the low MSH, the patient after they finish their treatment with an appropriate nasal sp spray, like the bag spray was so much so commonly used until the last four or five years where a number of other sprays became available. So the clinician would treat the patient and a month later reculture and gee, patient has Marcon's. Well, if they're a biotoxin on this patient, they have a low MSH. They're mm -hmm. going to contract Marcon's in days to a week or two. I talked to Dr. Shoemaker about this and he said, look at the susceptibility pattern. If you have three Marcon's on one patient in a year and 
you have three different susceptibility patterns, they are probably different strains of Markham. So it wasn't that the bag spray was becoming resistant. It was because the doctor was giving the patient enough time to contract another Markhans. Right. Okay. So as a result of that, he recommends for the last couple of years, the patients who are, have been diagnosed with biotoxin illness have the Markhans. They get treated for a certain number of weeks, let's say six weeks. Well, at week five, do a reculture. The results should come back negative. Right. If it does, then they should go on the maintenance dose of EDTA, 0.2%. And they should take, and the maintenance dose would be one spray each nostril twice a day for as long as it takes them to go through the entire Shoemaker protocol, bringing them up to the VIP stage, which is the last step. He found that Marcon's present when a patient is given the VIP, the Marcon's does to VIP the same thing that it does to MSH. It excretes certain toxins that break down the VIP. And that's not a good thing for two reasons. The patient's not getting any medical benefit and it's costing them a lot of money at the same time. So, so that was his uh, recommendation to keep the patient free of Marcon's through the whole Shoemaker protocol. Yeah, and I've seen that in practice too. One, there's a subset of people that may have worked with a different provider and they come work with us trying the whole SERS protocol again. They never tested for Marcon's and they have the Marcon's and that's may have been part of the reason why they never fully healed. And then we've yes. also seen a group of clients where they will test after the, the bag spray or the other, the EDTA, yeah. and they'll be negative for Marcon's after the f- first time they tested. But if they don't go on that maintenance dose, there is a risk because if your MSH is low, there's a susceptibility for your Marcon's to, exactly. um, yes. So I think that maintenance dose part is so critical and it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Who, who gets Marcon's? There's a person who is quote normal, who doesn't have biotoxin illness. Do they get Marcon's? Right. And from, from what Dr. Shoemaker found from studies, about 1% of the population get Marcon's, but they don't have biotoxin illness. Oh, interesting. So basically it would not be significantly detrimental to them if they had Marcon's. Okay. And then how does Marcon's get into the oral cavity area instead of just staying in the nasal? Uh, Must be at least five years ago now that Dr. Shoemaker had some uh, professional relationship with a dentist. I think he was in Arizona and the dentist was doing testing. I think he was a biological dentist. And um, so he did a number of procedures and he found from cavitations and from uh, other oral dental procedures, patients had Marcon's in their oral cavity. One of your question was, why is it that patients never eradicate Marcon's? Mm-hmm. Well, if they have oral issues from dental work and they don't eradicate the Marcon's in their oral cavity, they're gonna to continue to have Marcon's in their nasal pass. And just a little aside, I know that dentists have treatments, they use EDTA at different concentrations. Uh, one of the experiments I did is six or seven years ago was I tested Marcon's and other bacteria with just alcohol because I was interested in seeing what percentage of ethanol, ethyl alcohol is necessary to kill these bacteria. And it turns out that 7% is a good cutoff. So when I speak to uh, clinicians and they talk about patients who may have some oral issues, I had looked on mouthwashes. Now it turns out that Listerine, they have two different formulations. One has about 21% alcohol and the other one has 26% alcohol. So if a person were to rinse with that Listerine, let's say two or three times a day for a week or two, they should eradicate all of the bacteria. Now, Scope was the other one I looked at and they had in their two formulations, one was 13%, one was 15 So that still would be enough to eradicate whatever was going on orally. So I I make those suggestions. And one of the little things that I found, when you look at the label on these, they list the active ingredients, and then they have a whole series of inactive ingredients. And the alcohol was listed in the inactive ingredients. Interesting. It's the alcohol that's doing all the killing. So I I thought that was, I got a chuckle out of that. Yes. So if I 
had Marcon's and it's maybe not getting eradicated from the nasal. Let's say I had some oral issues and I'm not entirely sure, but just to be safe, if I use the Listerine or the scope uh, several times a week to hopefully eradicate any yeah. in the oral area, the concern that a lot of people in our community have is that it'll sterilize or affect the imbalance of the oral microbiome. Do you have any thoughts about that? A few years ago, I was at a meeting and I was speaking to a microbiologist research type guy. And the question came up about restoration of the normal microbiome. He says within several days, the bacteria that got eradicated is going to come back. I'm not sure if that's a good thing because if one of the bacteria is Marcon's, you don't want that to come back. But I, I don't think that's an issue. And it would be the clinicians seeing the patients to see if they had any adverse effects from eradicating all of the bacteria. And when you consider the nasal spray, that's killing everything in the nasal passage. That's true. Do you see Marcon's anywhere else other than the nasal and the oral areas? We get uh, different cultures from certain doctors, and we've seen vaginal cultures mm -hmm. with Marcon's, actually. And I think we have seen ear cultures and maybe some aerobic wound cultures where we have seen Marcon's. I know in the community, people get overwhelmed where let's say they eradicate Marcon's and then maybe their dog has it or their pet, and then they're just sharing it back and forth. Is that true? And how do we mitigate that happening? Okay. Uh, it's not only dogs, but cats. Okay. Cats are carriers as well. Just a little aside, we have two different types of swabs. One is the conventional swab. That's fine for adults, but we also have nasopharyngeal. It's a wire just with a little tab on the end of it. Mm -hmm. And it's meant for pediatric patients, dogs and cats. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Shoemaker some years ago found that dogs were carriers and, you know, people love their dogs and they lick their face <laughs> and they're going to pick up Marcon's from their animals. And I, I was at a meeting about four years ago, sitting at dinner with some of the doctors, and we got talking about cats, and uh, these two doctors each had five cats. So I sent them the nasopharyngeal, and they sent me the samples back, and I think eight out of the 10 cats had positive mark on tests. I think hygiene is basically the best way to avoid that transmission from the pet to the person. And Dr. Shoemaker had a procedure where you take the bed spray on a Q-tip and you rotate it into the nostril of the animal. And you do that, that there's a certain protocol to do that over a period of time to eradicate the mark. It, is the and, Marcon's just as harmful for these pets? Uh, I don't know the answer to okay. that. I don't think it is. Okay. Um, if there was problems with hormone levels, you, you would think you would see a change in behavior or some other adverse right. effects. So I, I, I'd have to ask Dr. Shu, I'll, next time I have an occasion or you have an occasion to sure. talk to him and ask that question. So okay. let's talk about what to do. So the first step is, okay, let's say you found a Shoemaker physician and then you start working with your Shoemaker certified practitioner. Uh, you test the blood work for SIRS, you have the biotoxin illness, then you may be on the binder. And so they will then have you test for Marcon's. Can you tell us, like, how do we test for Marcon's? If you can talk a little bit about the nasal, just the process. Well, we send out the kits and the, basically the kit is a swab okay. with a tube that has a, a preservative in it. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, we did some studies and we found that Marcon's and other bacteria, mold and yeast are preserved for about a month at room temperature in that preservative. So people who don't get to the post office in a timely fashion to send it to us, it, it's not a concern about the viability of the sample. We recommend that you, and, and we send the instructions with the kit for both the nasopharyngeal as well as the standard swab. Right. And basically most of what we do is with the standard swab. swab. And we indicate in the instructions to go up into the nostril about an inch and a half to two inches, rotate it, take it out, go into the other nostril, rotate and take it out. Uh, some doctors only will do one nostril. And according to Dr. Shoemaker, that was fine as well. Okay. Most doctors will do both nostrils. And then you put it back in the tubes and you send it to us. And we're here uh, processing samples Monday through Saturday. And we process them. We plant them. So even those 
that come in on a Saturday will get planted so we can work them up on Monday. And turnaround time is usually three to five days uh, for, the, for the results on the mock-ons. Uh, one other thing we do is, if you notice on the requisition, the first test line says mock-ons and other bacteria. So whatever we isolate, we report back to the clinician. Because we don't know what issues the patient has. They may have serious sinus issues. And we see enteric organisms. I'm sure you've seen some of these reports. Uh, e. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter. We see some of the non-enterics like Pseudomonas. Uh, occasionally, we actually see Strep Pneumo in these, in these uh, specimens. So whatever is in the specimen, aerobically, we work up. That's why you see multiple organisms. And generally speaking, most of the nasal sprays will kill everything. Mm. And we can get into that in a little bit. We do fungal cultures. And I tell the clinicians, it's not part of Dr. Shoemaker's protocol. But if patients have sinus issues, they could be due to bacterial problems or mold and yeast. And I say, if the patient has no symptoms, I, I wouldn't order a fungal culture. Only if they have symptoms and you want to see why they have a problem you get a complete picture with the bacteria and the mold. If someone were to have nasal symptoms, but they only got the first one it, and they're positive for Marcon's, would those sprays get the fungal parts, the other illnesses too? Yes. Uh, um, okay. You want to talk about the treatments? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So there's about six or seven different nasal sprays that can be used. I want to talk a minute about the bag spray. Like, there's yes. an important point I want to make. The bag spray has been around probably 20 years. And bag spray came about between Dr. Shoemaker and Dennis Cates at Hawkinton Drug. Okay. And Dennis developed the, the uh, bag spray. The BEG stands for Bactroban, which is 0.2%, EDTA, which is 1%. And some pharmacies will use lower, like 0.5%. I think that's okay. The gentamicin in the Hopkinton preparation is 0.025%. I've spoken to probably at this point, hundreds of patients and physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs and so forth. Some of them have told me their patients get uh, a bloody nose when they use the bag spray. So I asked them, what's the concentration of the gentamicin? I've yet to find a pharmacy that uses what Hopkinton developed 0 0.025. They use anywhere from 0.1 to 3%. I've spoken to patients that have had gentamicin symptoms, adverse reactions with concentrations that high, ringing in the ears and so forth. So if the clinicians are going to use a pharmacy, make sure that they specify the concentration of the gentamicin to be 0 0.025. So that's one relatively broad spectrum. It kills gram positive, gram negative. It turns out from experiments I did several years ago, EDTA kills gram positives, it kills mold, and it kills yeast. So that one spray would be effective if you just ordered the Marcons, but possibly had mold or yeast, the EDTA would eradicate that. Uh, the, the, the common one used today is a combination of uh, colloidal silver, and I, I don't like the name colloidal, such a broad name, and it doesn't mean an awful lot. What it is, is ionic silver. It's silver with a plus one charge. It can be, uh, my original testing about six years ago was around 20 parts per million, and it was effective in vitro. I found that it wasn't that effective clinically, and I did experiments and found that 50 parts per million really was the optimal uh, concentration. So 50 parts per million with anywhere from 0.25 to 0.5% EDTA seems to be very effective. I was at a meeting, I think you were at the same meeting last year, and Dr. Doringer made a comment that he's treated patients with bag spray or silver EDTA, and he was successful in all cases. So. Uh, it, it's a good choice. I think it's a good choice. I do want to mention something that's important. Over the years, I've talked to a lot of patients. Patients will call and say, can you explain the lab report to me? 
And by law, you, you have to send them the lab report. And I say, have you spoken to your clinician? Well, I don't have an appointment for two months, and I was very interested in knowing what this means. So in the course of the conversation, I find that they use saline nasals, nasal rinses. Silver, the ionic silver in prescription will react with the chloride in the sodium chloride and produce silver chloride, which is not very active. So if the silver EDTA isn't working and the patient's using saline rinses, that's probably the reason it isn't working. Now, a new spray, just within the last six months or so, and I, I've done studies for, for Hopkinton on this, was a combination of grapefruit seed extract and EDTA, half a percent of each. Uh, the grapefruit seed extract kills everything. It kills gram-positive, gram-negative mold and yeast. It, it's a good choice if there was any issues with sulfur EDTA, that could be prescribed. I have a couple of comments. Let, let me mention a few others. There's something that Hopkinton uh, developed and the product, the core of the product is uh, patented by somebody else. And it's called Wizobax. And it's a witch hazel formulation with EDTA. And that works very well on gram positive bacteria. And then uh, something called Formula One NSB, and that was developed by Dr. Jody DeShore. Okay. Um, she's a clinician in New Jersey, and she's an herbalist as well. And uh, she and Hopkinton Drug got together, and Hopkinton started uh, offering that as a treatment for Marcox. At this point, Hopkinton has sold to a pharmacy in Texas, in the Austin, Texas area, and all of the formulations have been transferred over to that pharmacy. So I think if you call Hopkinton today, the number automatically goes to the Texas lab, Texas pharmacy, and it's called P as in Peter, D as in David labs. Right. And they're, they're very good. I, I've actually gotten some prescriptions from them and their turnaround time is good and their customer service is quite good. They, so you can't get any of these formulations without a prescription from your provider. Are there any over-the-counter um, yes. treatments? Okay. Okay. Two in the Sova category. I did testing on a product called ACS 200. It's an oral uh, spray, Sova spray. It's made by a company called Results RNA. And if you were to go on the internet, you can see these products. Uh, a couple of years ago, they came out with a nasal spray. Now, the ACS 200 is an oral spray, and they promote it for enhancement of the immune system. They came out with a 50 part per million silver spray called ACS nasal spray. The silver itself by itself will kill gram-positive, gram-negative mold and yeast. And the EDTA in the prescription adds to the killing power because the EDTA kills gram positives, mold, and yeast. So just the, the silver itself, I, I, we, we have a lot of clinicians, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, and in some states, they don't have the uh, authorization to write prescriptions. Right. And okay. I would suggest either the ACS nasal spray. The other one that's common is uh, Argentin 23, and that's mm -hmm. another nasal spray that's, that's effective. They're both ionic. Um, silver, and it's the ionic silver that, that does the killing. There's, there's another product related to the grapefruit seed extract, and a lot of clinicians know this. It's called Xlear, X-L-A-R, and it's grapefruit seed extract and uh, xylitol. It's a sugar, and the, the xylitol breaks up the biofilm, and the grapefruit seed extract does the killing. And I did some limited experiments with that, and it was effective against uh, <laughs> gram-positive, gram-negative mold and yeast. And it, it's a good alternative, and if the patient is compliant, it could be a less expensive option for them because that would cost $15 or so okay. for the nasal okay. spray. And a prescription is around $100, $110, $150. Are there risks with using silver? Um, long-term? As, as far as I know from my reading, 
I haven't seen anything okay. that talks about silver toxicity. Occasionally, I'll have a clinician ask me about it being a heavy metal, mm -hmm. and it's not a heavy metal. Okay. okay, it's not in that category of metals. And um, this company, Results RNA with their oral ACS 200 oral spray, they recommend six to 12 sprays twice a day forever to enhance your immune system. So uh, okay. we, we would probably hear if there were toxicity issues with, with that kind of a usage, I would think. Yeah, there's a community of people that really believe in colloidal silver, the ionic silver yeah. for healing yeah. everything. They use it on everything. Yeah, it does kill everything. Uh, one other, a couple of other things about treatments I wanna mention. Mm -hmm. Argentin product is available in liter bottles. I think they're about $90. And I saw a study back in 2004, and this was when COVID, the original COVID was a problem. And uh, the use of a nebulizer with the Argentin, well, they didn't mention Argentin, but they talked about ionic silver. Using a nebulizer was extremely effective in eradicating the COVID. And we talked earlier about patients who have dental issues that would harbor the Marcons and eventually they can't get rid of it in their nasal passage. Right. I would say that nebulizing the colloidal silver could be effective because it affects the entire nasal, sinus, oral, throat, lungs, mm -hmm. bronchial tubes, and lungs. So that would be another consideration. Uh, something more recently, I've done some experiments with a, a very expensive product called hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Uh, this is uh, something you would buy in a health food store or the internet. It's called food grade hydrogen peroxide. You might be you're probably familiar with that. And the only difference between that and what you buy at the local pharmacy is what we have in our medicine chest has two or three uh, preservatives. Mm -hmm. Food grade is totally pure hydrogen peroxide. And uh, I found that at about 0.3%, it killed positive negative mold and yeast. And I've had, I've talked to some clinicians about this and they say, well, how would you prepare it? So I, I give them a little example. The patient would have to prepare this themselves. Okay. And most everybody has a whiskey shot glass in their house. Okay. So if you buy 3% food grade and you take one whiskey glass full and two whiskey glass full of uh, purified water, mm. and put them into some kind of a container, you could use it as a nasal spray or you could use it in a nebulizer, that would make it 1%. Now, 1%, most people can tolerate that 1%. Some people are sensitive and it's irritating. So I tell them to take that 1% and do one whiskey glass of that and one of purified water. That makes a half a percent. Right. And it's still far up above my cutoff of 0.3 mm -hmm. from, from my in vitro experiments. So some people are trying that now. It's interesting, I came, because I got into it, I looked at different pieces of studies and literature, and there's some studies out there that shows how effective it is against COVID. And this goes back to 2020 and 2019, and the government never told us that. Of course. But I, won't, I won't get into that right now. I know. Okay? <laughs> there's one other comment about the Marcon's culture. You see on your lab report, all the antibiotics, you see the R's right, and the S's right. and the I's. Doctors who are not familiar with the Shoemaker Protocol will call and say, which drug do you suggest I use? I say, none of them. I say, the only reason we, reason we run that is to determine if it's Marcon's. So we get a culture, we plant it, takes one or two or three days to grow it out. We then test it to see if it's coag negative staph. So at that point, we don't know it, what the resistance pattern is. So we run it a susceptibility, then we can say if there's two or more R's or an R and an I, then it's classified as Marcon. So it's unlike all of the susceptibilities that doctors and nurses and clinicians see, it's not used to treat the patient. It's just used to determine Marcon's. Marcon. Okay. So I just okay. wanted to make that point too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Even with the hydrogen peroxide, a lot of practitioners, if you have a little bit of mold in your bathroom or like your shower area, 
yeah. and it's a little bit of cleaning, they'll use that as well. And I know there's common knowledge to use bleach, but actually that's a bad idea. The hydrogen peroxide is the way to go. Yeah, you know, the environmental guys that come to our meetings, they're right. the experts. And I, I can remember them specifically saying it's deceiving because there's a reaction with the Clorox, but it's right. not killing it. And, and you can buy, you probably know this, you can buy uh, bottles that you put the sprayer to spray the showers and all yes. of that with hydrogen peroxide. I think it's 3%. Actually. So. so do you know offhand if you have to scrub it or if it's just, because I just have them wipe, um, some of my clients wipe it down after they leave the spray on for about 15, 20 minutes. Is there a specific right. procedure off the top of your head? I, I, I'm not familiar specifically, okay. but it just would make sense to me that you spray it, wait 15, 20 minutes and then wipe it off. Right, okay. If there is a person, so I have a specific client I can think of that they did the bag spray, maybe they even did the EDTA, but the Marcons went from like large amounts to maybe moderate or small, but it never fully went away. Would okay. you at that, and they used it for months. Oh. That is not common. Generally speaking, I do see it removed after about six weeks or eight weeks of usage. But for that person, would you switch the spray or would you look at maybe the oral parts or something else? Um, I would switch the spray. Okay. I would go from bag spray, say, to the Sova EDTA. Mm -hmm. I would question her to see if she's had any dental issues in the last year or two. Okay. Any procedures, because that's what could lead to that. And getting back to my uh, mouthwash, you might want her to use the Listerine or the Scope for a couple of weeks and see if that helps. And if it does, then you know there was an oral issue at, at the same time. Do you find that certain patients have to take the treatment longer because they have large amounts of the Marcons versus small amounts or moderate amounts? Yeah, I would say a couple of things. Uh, if they have a biofilm and it's mm -hmm. strongly positive, I, I would say go to eight weeks mm -hmm. because let's say it's large and the biofilm was three plus strong that's going to be more resistant to treatment. Mm -hmm. And the longer the treatment, I think the more beneficial it would be for the patient. And whether it's BEG or the silver EDTA, uh, I, I don't think it would be an issue either one. If you, you were using the BEG and it went from a large amount to a moderate or small, and you said you're going to switch the silver EDTA, I would do it for at least four to six weeks and see. But I think a little history on her dental Okay. activity would be very important. From your experience, how quickly have you seen, um, if someone has removed Marcons from the treatment, how yes. quickly do you see it and re-inoculate? It, it could happen within a week. Wow. If, if they're a biotoxin illness, they're a SERS patient, their MSH is going to be low and mm -hmm. they're going to pick up the Marcons within a week or so. I think. Just from my experience going back a few years ago when the doctors were complaining about resistance and I came to the conclusion it really wasn't resistance. It was the patient having low MSH and being off medication, off the nasal spray for two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. they, get, they get either the same strain back from their environment or they have a, a different strain based, based on the susceptibility. So I know that low MSH can be because you're not through the whole protocol, the yes. Shoemaker protocol, but could it also be, let's say your MSH is not the lowest of the low, it's not the negative or less than eight, but it's still under the 30 something, but could yeah. it be that maybe you're also in new exposure that then makes you more susceptible to re-inoculation of Marcon's or well, not? The, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say if, if let, let's just take the issue, say with a dog okay. and if the dog has Marcon's and the patient has been on the a nasal spray for six weeks, eight weeks. And if they were tested to see they didn't have Marcons, they could easily contract it from their partner or from an animal. It would be easier for them to contract it than a person like you or me who doesn't have biotoxin illness. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. and absolutely. It seems pretty simple to treat this. Is there a reason that Dr. Shoemaker has it as a secondary step. So first get out of exposure, then take the binder, then you can start the Marcon's um, treatment. Is there yeah. a reason why it's at that step? And then it sounds pretty easy. Like, oh, I'll just get tested. I can go on your site, get the test, and then I can treat myself since there's over the counter. Do you recommend that based no, on no, no. the protocol? <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, 
I, I, I talk to a lot of clinicians and a lot of patients, and I, I feel sorry for these patients. They don't know why they, they got this test done. They don't have a clinician who knows mold illness. And you know the, the classic story, I've been sick for five years. I've gone to 10 different doctors, and they refer me to a psychiatrist. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in the last five years. And I say, where do I have the lab report and I see where they live. So I say, I have a client list and I can go through the client list and give you the names of two or three or four doctors who I'm pretty sure know about biotoxin illness. And I give them those and I say, go on the internet, look them up, make your own judgment, call them. If you don't get to the right doctor, you will never get better. And they spent a fortune along the way as well. I feel so sorry for these people. Every day, every other day, I seem to be talking to somebody. If they take it upon themselves to do the test and they don't have a doctor and they don't know what to do with the result, I tell them you need to find a mold illness doctor. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think it's just fixing the nasal or the oral area because you'll either get it back because of the low MSH. If you're still in exposure, it'll just keep re-inoculating. And so it becomes a Band-Aid. So I agree people want so bad to have this quick fix of a way to heal, but in this illness, because it's so complex, multi-system, yeah. multi-system, you just really have to go through the protocol, but if you do it right, you can actually heal and get your life back. Yeah. And that's why I advocate so much for it. Yep. I, I had a fellow call me, I think he was from Texas and he had a lab result and he said he was talking to some people and Dr. Shoemaker's protocol doesn't work. Oh, I hear that all the time. So, all the time. I say, uh, let, let me tell you, the only protocol that works is Dr. Shoemaker's. The only one that works or a modification thereof. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a lot of clinicians, you know, they use different binders and all of that, but it's basically Shoemaker protocol. And I, I won't mention any names at this point, but there's a number of doctors who rely on the urine tests and all of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And those patients are going to go nowhere. I know. And I, I feel sorry for them, but and I'm pretty blunt with them, by the way. I'm not, I'm not going to be blunt here. Okay. But uh, well, I, I can advocate for it. I just had a team meeting with my nutritional therapist team, and we we're going over the differences between the mycotoxin urine test versus the blood work that Dr. Shoemaker recommends yeah. from the, um, from LabCorp quest and, or his yeah. genie test. And there's a difference. So we, we literally looked at one case. So there was one person she felt that she might have mold illness. So we did a mycotoxin test. This is before I knew about SIRS and it was clean. So everyone else would say you are clean, you are healthy. And even if she did excess glutathione or went into the sauna, we just don't know what that means. We did her blood work a few months later when we finally found out about SIRS. She has the genetic type. She has the multiple susceptibility, multiple ones. Her C4A skyrocketed, TGF beta is imbalanced. MSH is less than eight. So no. it's just, you would have missed that had you oh. only focused on the mycotoxin urine yeah. test. Yeah, a- absolutely. Well, so uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond my control, but I try to direct these people as, as much as, as I can. And uh, let me just mention something else. Yes. Um, I don't know the listeners, the people who are tuned into this and how much they're into the Dr. Shoemaker protocol. But many of the, the new clinicians I speak to, we send out a package of information. And what it is, is a couple of articles written by Dr. Shoemaker certified clinicians. Some of them are nurse practitioners, and MDs and DOs and so forth. And then we include a list of the treatments as we already discussed those treatments. And about Two months later, I get a call from a doctor and I have a report in front of me that they want to go over. I can tell by the questions they ask. They never open the email. And I say to them, you know, uh, we have on file a very good article. It was prepared in 2020 by a nurse practitioner down in North Carolina. And it's very well written. And it even includes what lab to send the blood test to with the lab number. It's about the only article that that is that inclusive. And then I say, there's a protocol early in the diagnosis. 
from Dr. Shoemaker, where he took 37 symptoms and categorized them into 13 clusters. And if a patient has one symptom in each of eight of those 13, they have a 92% chance of having biotoxinoma, SIRS. Right. And if you do this test online called ECS, it's a visual test, and they fail that, then the probability is 98%. Now, you haven't done a culture, you haven't done a blood test, and you can then say, it's time to start doing some blood work. And they were amazed, the ability to be able to do this with Dr. Schumacher's protocol. So basically, I'm telling them, order, don't order the Marcons until you've qualified the patient. So I'm taking money out of my pocket, telling them, don't, don't send me Marcons unless you know the reason why you're sending them. Right. And right. they're very interested in that medical history and those symptoms that can be used. And I think that's powerful, very powerful. We always start with symptomologies too, the symptom cluster. Sometimes our diet is so clean that it will mask some of the symptoms and that's where it gets a little tricky for us. But generally speaking, I now see history and I can see it, but that we'll have them do the vision test. And some people will pass, some people will fail, but most people fail. And then some people are still hesitant about doing the blood work because it's expensive. So that's yeah. where we'll say you can consider doing the Marcon's test first because it's more economical. And if you sure. are positive for that, you really need to do the blood work. And so that's yeah. somehow, sometimes I do that as a bridge to get them yes. to do the blood work. So I think that also makes sense too. Yeah. And I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, according, according to Dr. Shoemaker, Marcon's is a marker for low MSH. Right, right. right. So if, if you have some symptomology and you do the Marcon's and it's strongly positive, the MSH is probably low. So, it, but the doctors don't even know that part of it. So. <laughs> Of course, they never read the material that we sent them. Well, they're going to just test for my mycotoxins. And then from there, they'll just change the diet and do some supplements and then say it's it's good or get yeah. out of exposure. And that's enough when it's so not the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Should people reach out to you if they have questions about Marcon's? If, um, if you can maybe plug your lab and um, just, you know, where people can find you if they have any questions. Yeah. If, if they go on our website, they could... They'll, they'll find us, but they can call. If, if any of them have done lab tests, they'll have the name of the lab. They can go in, get our phone number. I'm here almost all the time, okay. except when I go to a meeting or something like that, but I'm here. And uh, even when I'm out, Laura, who answers the phone most of the time, will take a message and she'll text me and say, call Dr. So-and-so between this time mm -hmm. and that time when I'm out of town or something like that. So I'm glad I talked to the clinicians all the time. Happy to do so. I know I've been so <laughs> grateful for all of the support you've provided. I mean, there was a client that I reached out to you for because I was a little confused about all the other results other than the Marcons being positive. And you are so helpful and your staff is always very helpful and kind. So I just appreciate it. Well, that's it so nice much. to know. Yeah, That's yeah. very nice. I'll pass that on. I'll put your testing, your links in the show notes, but thank you so much for this. Sure. I think one real reason I wanted you to come on is I found that there are some practitioners that don't do the Marcon's testing. And I think it's a mistake. Yeah. I have seen a lot of healing through the Marcon's testing after they go through the binders. I see further healing. And I think it's a mistake. I, I had one client specifically, and maybe she was dealing with more than Marcon's but she had to use a nasal spray every night just to sleep. And after she did some of the binder, she was passing the VCS test. Then we did the Marcon's uh, testing and she was positive. She did the Marcon's just for a few weeks and she didn't need the other spray ever again. And wow. now she doesn't need it. Yeah. And now she's clean, but she's taking the maintenance dose because her MSH is still low, Yeah, right. but she doesn't need any, she doesn't have congestion at night. She doesn't have the, she doesn't need any other nasal spray to go to bed when she used it for decades. Oh so, my God. And oh. if we never tested Marcon's, we would have never known that we would have never yeah. had her use the nasal sprays to even further her healing. Yeah. So it's been remarkable. That's great. No, that's great. Um, so I, I'm here and uh, I take phone calls. I, I do some of the testing myself, but okay. the testing I do, I can be interrupted and I make a note to myself so I know where I am <laughs> when I come back. So I'm, I'm glad to talk to the clinicians if I can be of help to them. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, are you going to be at SIRS-X? And I think it's uh, July. 
Oh, for sure. Okay, yeah. I'll see you. I'll see you there then. Yeah, I'm already registered for that. Okay. Okay. Look forward well, to seeing you there. Yes, uh, look forward to seeing you again too. So, thank you so much again for joining me. You're very welcome. Okay. Glad to do so. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. Dr. Musto is a wealth of information. He has been just doing clinical research for many, many decades, and he just loves this stuff and information. And he's always trying to help the patient and the clinicians just get people to more root cause healing. I hope that this helps you to understand Marcon's and anything that relates to the nasal passageway. If you are dealing with yeast or mold or fungal stuff, any of the things that he talked about can actually be a support, especially if you deal with sinusitis and other nasal issues that don't allow you to sleep well and just don't help you to breathe very well. It's really fascinating and it's something that I definitely want to look into more. I hope that this provides you another lever of healing. And I hope that if you do have chronic illness, that you always consider Marcon's and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. While it's not the easiest illness, if it is the illness you're suffering from, you want to get treated so that you can actually get to healing and live a life nearly symptom-free. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.